There are so many iconic photographs of our favorite space missions, but there are also a huge many that we've never seen, and there are two people who are trying to correct that. Yep, today we're talking to J.L. Pickering and John Bisney, who have released a number of books of previously unseen photos, which have helped to retell the story of our favorite missions to people like us who think we know it all. What's your favorite spaceflight photograph? Please let us know via our social media pages at Space and Things One on Twitter and at Space and Things Podcast on Instagram and Facebook or via the contact form on our website. And please consider joining us over at patreon.com forward slash space and things. But right now, enjoy episode 148 of the Space and Things Podcast. Oh my God. I'm going to shake off a case of the Thursdays and listen to Space and Things with Emily Carney and Dave Child. I'm Emily Carney. And I'm Dave Giles. And welcome to episode 148 of our podcast. How are you doing, Emily? I'm doing great. I'm doing uh, pretty good, actually. So, yeah, having a, having a good week, having a good time, all that. Yeah, congratulations is in order on your new job. Well done. Thank you. Tell us about it. Tell us about it. Yeah. uh, Well, I I just signed the ink on it. I'm going to be the, uh, basically the manager of public engagement and social media for the Space 3.0 Foundation. Our mission with Space 3.0 is to basically preserve space history and and inspire the future, inspire people who are interested in space history and who want to study it. Another thing we do is we publish Quest Magazine. Uh, If you have not subscribed Yes, if you have not subscribed to Quest Magazine, it's only $29, I believe. Please try to invest in it. It's it's a, an amazing resource if you love space history. Lots of great articles in it. I'm a subscriber myself, so I, I do have to give a little plug for it. So in my new role, I just started, so I'm just getting ramped up. But in my new role right now, um, I'm hoping to capture uh, everybody's interest that, you know, put out a lot of cool space history stuff and, and hopefully get some uh, space uh, history interviews out there, stuff you could read or maybe even listen to, you know, oral histories and stuff like that. But and there'll be more as well. It's not just going to be limited to that. So I'm just getting started. I'm just getting ramped up and I'm really excited for those curious. I'm probably going to get questions. I'm still at Celestis, just more on a part time basis, but I'm still with them and I'm still their biggest cheerleader. So I, I love the I love Charles and I love the the Celestis family. I just wanted to put that out there for because I know I'll get people, did you quit Celestis? No, I did not. So that's basically what I'm doing. So things are things are pretty good. I'm pretty happy right now. Fantastic. If you don't mind, can we briefly talk about this? Because I didn't bring it up last week and I completely forgot because obviously it feels like so long ago, but we haven't recorded since you've been to the Cosmosphere. Yes, that is true. I did go to the Cosmosphere uh, in May for the uh, Skylab, their Skylab 50th event. Uh, it was really awesome. I got to uh, be alongside David Hitt, uh, Milt Windler and Jack Lausma, which was kind of surreal because they're all legends. I'd never seen the Cosmosphere Museum before. I'm not just saying this because they had me over there. It is just incredible. There were artifacts there that I didn't even know existed. If you have not been to the Cosmosphere, please try to make it a priority to get to. Um, It is in sort of a remote place. It's in Hutchinson, Kansas, so you have to drive from Wichita. But it is worth every second. Just, Just try to get there. I can't think of a... Uh, favorite artifact there that there was so much um it was a trip seeing odyssey yeah absolutely oh my god isn't it isn't it crazy i've I've watched the apollo 13 movie so much i could just re- recite the movie you know even the parts that are st- kind of stupid <laughs> you know where, where they have the freddo and jack fight for yeah, like yeah, no yeah. reason we will not go bouncing off the walls just to end up right back where we started from. Yeah, I'm like, Fredo. Fredo would never, in real life, Fredo would not do this, but it, just a heads up. But yeah, like I, I've seen that movie so much, I can recite chunks of dialogue from it. But to see the actual spacecraft was like, wow, that's real. You know, it, it, it hits you differently when you actually see it with your eyeballs. It, I can't explain it. it it's just incredible. They have a ton of other artifacts there as well. I don't want to just limit it to to Odyssey, but, you know, seeing Ron Evans' spacesuit, yeah. I mean, just like, wow. The last person to do a deep space EVA. He died so young, he's sort of an unknown quantity. 
And I just was like, wow, they have a spacesuit. He was a big guy. You know, it's just, it makes you feel that much closer to the actual mission. I could talk forever about this, but I'll yeah. try to wrap it up. It, Cosmosphere, if you can get there, do it. You also went to the International Space Development Conference. Was it good? Well, I've never been to a space conference. I've got no idea what they're like. It was good. It was good. I did go to some of the breakout sessions and I went to some of the talks. I saw uh, Dylan Taylor, oh, who cool. has been on our show before, and he is also a uh, Blue Origin astronaut. He did a talk that was awesome. And I went to some great talks. My favorite talks were by uh, Marianne Dyson, female flight controller. I'd love to get her on the show sometime. And uh, Anastasia Ford, who works at NASA Johnson, and they're just doing amazing stuff with Lunar Regolith. And she's another one who might be a show candidate. Uh, she's really awesome. She's doing amazing stuff at NASA and, and, and is an incredible young person who uh, champions space. I say young person because I, I, I'm, I'm old, but she's uh, probably in her 20s. But she, yeah, just she has an incredible career already. So lots of highlights from there. I, I had a great talk. Fantastic. Right. Let's get on with this week's main feature. Digital cameras and mobile phones with cameras in have really changed our relationship with photography. But the days of cameras with film, which needed to be developed, isn't that far in the past. And our favorite space programs of the past were defined by photographs taken on those analog cameras. Obviously, the internet and internet speeds, which allow higher resolution photographs to be readily available, are also fairly new things. So there are a huge number of photographs which just aren't available online, which feels weird when you think of how in the last few years, all our lives are, feel like they're online somewhere, either in a cloud or on social media site somewhere, or at least on a hard drive of some description. So personally, I think about all the photo albums my mum and dad have, which have not been digitalized and something I keep campaigning to do within the family, but that's another story. But there must be trillions of photos out there which ne we never see and have perhaps even been forgotten about. And from a historian's perspective, that means there are treasure troves out there full of wonderful in images, which can uh, help to tell stories that we might not know about, even on topics where we really think we know the full story. And spaceflight is really no different. So today we're talking to JL Pickering and John Bisney, who set up Retro Space Images, a huge online resource of photographs online, and moved on to some releasings of some incredible books of photographs, which they've collected over the years, uh, many of which are from private collections which the world has ever seen, and that makes these books very compelling. Their most recent book is called Photographing America's First Astronauts, which we spoke about briefly last week, and it inspired us to get in contact with Pickering and Bisney to see if they'd come and tell us more. Well, they said yes. Better than eating broccoli and space and things with Emily Carney and Dave Giles. All right. So hello to you both and welcome to our podcast. Uh, we've mentioned your books a number of times over the course of our history as a podcast. So it's great to finally get you on. So let's get some background. Uh, let's start with JL and then John. Uh, we'll hear from you as well. So what started you on your space journey? Was there a particular mission that uh, captured your interest? Well, I've always said that while I remembered the Gemini missions, it was the Apollo fire that really, for better or worse, kind of triggered my interest in, in the whole space program. Wow. Everything just progressed from there. I mean, you know, you went from a recovery period after Apollo 1 into the uh, Apollo missions and what's not to like. Absolutely. Well, I'm a baby boomer and I'm a little older than JL, not by much, but a little older. And I actually remember watching Mercury launches with my fellow elementary school classmates when I was a kid. And then my family moved to Florida in 1964. So I was uh, really enthused about the program. The astronauts, of course, were all national heroes at the time. So I made my folks take me over there. I saw my first rocket launch in 1965. Wow. It was between Gemini 10 and Gemini 11, I believe. It just took off from there. Uh, my uh, career was as a journalist, and so I was fortunate enough to incorporate that interest into my reporting career. And then I met JL, gosh, what, almost 25, more than 25 years ago. I think it was around 1990 at the STS-35 scrub. 
I think it's the first time we actually met. That's true. <laughs> I love that. So I had to laugh real quick when you said you made your parents take you over to the Cape. I was reminded of something yesterday. When we used to go on vacation to Florida, we used to go to Fort Lauderdale. And uh, I used to make my folks stop at the Cape on the way down, and then we'd stop again on the way back. So that went on for a while until I was able to go on these vacations on my own. So that I just spent the, you know, four or five days there as opposed to hitting distance. Amazing. It's awesome. Okay. So before publishing your books, uh, Retro Space Images was and still is an incredible resource for those obsessed with rare space photos. So tell us how you begin assembling your excellent collections and, and have you continually added to the archives? Well, as far as building up a archive of images, it started with a lot of letter writing to people back in the day. And uh, once you started to pick up a few photos, then you start writing press people. Then you start paying attention to auctions. I had some friends in the right spot, spots that uh, worked at NASA or like John in the media. And before you know it, uh, you've got all kinds of connections for these things. And it just snowballs after a while. So uh, they see you're uh, legitimately doing stuff with these images. And uh, I, I still collect photos per se, but I don't, I'm happy with the files now as opposed to harder copies all the time. As far as the retro space images, yes, but I put all that stuff on a, on disk at one point. I don't actively sell those anymore, distribute them. If somebody really needs some stuff, I'm happy to help them out. But I've built up quite a collection that's not on disk that we've been using for these book projects and we've got more stuff to do yet. And so I'm still holding back on a lot of material. Wow. Now, maybe at some point after we get through doing what we're doing with books, I'll, I'll, find, I'll figure out a way to let them all go in, in higher res. So let's fast forward to your latest book, Photographing America's First Astronauts, which showcases NASA photographer Bill Tobbs' uh, candid images of the Mercury program. So how did you both become aware of the treasures that Tobbs archives held? I'll give you a little bit of background, which is that, as JL said, I think actually we, we first contacted the other maybe in 86, when you're right, I think we first met in 1990. But we, as a result of that, because JL could come down to several launches, and I was covering them for um, originally RKO Radio Network and then CNN, we would spend days either before those launches or after the shuttle launches during the 90s and maybe into the 2000s, tracking down, visiting retired folks who worked on the space program, being the managers, to the workers, to the reporters, to the photographers, anybody from back in the day. We love sitting down, talking with them, hearing their stories, seeing if they have any, any goodies they wanted to, to let us have. And one of those people, uh, most of them were in Florida. But one person we visited was in the Washington, D.C. area, and I'll let JL take over the story from that. Yeah, Bill and I had exchanged letters numerous times, I would say, during that time period, and he could tell I was the real deal, I guess. So when we, uh, I'd gone out to visit John, I said, uh, we need to go figure out if we can go see Bill. And Bill was uh, in a wheelchair at that point. So you really had to accommodate his schedule as far as going over, over to his place. But we did manage to uh, set up an appointment. And uh, I remember going in and sitting down. I think his caretaker was there. And then uh, there comes Bill in one of those uh, wheelchairs on the, on the lift <laughs> coming down from upstairs. I got, and he comes in and sits down. And we have a... A nice conversation with him and he's pulling out brochures and pamphlets and NASA books and showing us all the pictures that he took, which we pretty well knew anyhow. But when you ask about his archives, we didn't know anything about that at the time. And he wasn't about to say, Hey, you want to go out in the garage and see all my stuff? Uh, it, it never got to that point. We were just happy to have been able to spend a couple hours with him and enjoy his company. 
So you have to fast forward to uh, three or four years ago. It's when the Apollo 11 movie was out. And ironically, John and I had gone to see that movie. Neither one of us had seen it yet. So I said, well, let's, we have to go see it. So uh, let's do that. And we uh, left the theater, got in the car, and I'm checking messages on my phone. And there's a voicemail from this guy who says he's Bill Tobb's son-in-law. And they have a lot of stuff at the house. And he wanted to know if I was interested in uh, pursuing that or hearing about it. And I, you know, immediately I called him. And I would say within a week, I had set up an appointment to go out to the Tom residence, which is where the son-in-law and Bill's daughter were living in Bill's old house. So I said, I made the appointment to go out there and I spent five days with them going through all the material. And I told him right then, I said, you know, you mean there's definitely a book, maybe two books here in this stuff. And I got to say, it wasn't in very good order at all. And <laughs> from what I learned from Bill's son-in-law, it wasn't stored very well before I saw it, he had, it literally was in the garage, uh, scattered all over the place. The cleanup on a lot of the negatives has been extensive. And I think you all know Ed Hangefeld. Yeah. I talk with Ed almost every day and Ed has been a miracle worker as far as cleaning up some of the really tough ones. So it's, it's still an ongoing project because there's stuff that we didn't use in the book that we are still working on. So part of the deal with Bill's son-in-law and daughter is we're, we're going to get it all cleaned up and give them good copies back. Nice. Uh, that actually brings me to my next question. So I, I'm sure a lot of, or quite a few of the photos in the book and, and elsewhere required some restoration. Can you tell us a bit about the process and how, you know, you make some of these photos that have been sitting out in the garage usable for, for publication? The biggest problem with them are, um, scratches. There's a lot of scratches on, on, especially the Grissom material and they were even in sleeves. That's what's, what's wow. really disappointing. At first glance, they look like they're stored well, but when you, when you scan them and start uh, realizing the extent of the damage, some of them can be cleaned up in five minutes and others are two to three hours. And Ed has even showed me some, I, I do, I do this as well, but Ed is better at it. He can knock these off three to my, my one usually. And mm. he has shown me some stuff where he literally worked all day on, on some of these. Wow. But it's mainly scratches, and the usual imperfections. And we're real, uh, how should they say it? Uh, we'd like to do thorough jobs on these cleanups <laughs> and not just kind of, I'm the kind of guy that if I'm watching a documentary and they start scanning or they start showing photos and stuff, I'm going, really, you couldn't take another, you know, 20 seconds and knock that <laughs> dust off the guy's face. I mean, it's so obvious, you know, uh, that stuff drives me nuts. Yeah. And, and it's also true. I would say, you know, in other space books that have been published over the years. And I say over the years, I mean, over the past 40 years, you know, JL, I've looked at some of those and thumbed through them. Now they're primarily text heavy books. They're not necessarily photo books. And, you know, they'll typically have a photo section in the middle, you know, mostly black and white and mm -hmm. sun color. And he'll look at those and say, oh my God, look how grainy that is. And, you know, so. <laughs> what John's referring to is I'll see a photo that's very, oh, very well-known photo, a famous photo. And I know there's plenty of nice copies of that photo out there. And yet you have a, a full page and a, you know, a large format book and it, it looks like crap. And that drives me nuts too. So you'll never yeah. see a yeah. poor quality photo in our books. <laughs> and, and let, you know, that's yeah. probably a good point. Let me just thought, talk for a couple of minutes about our philosophy about it because I think what that shows is some other authors don't take the photos obviously as seriously as we do because we do photo books. Uh, but I think as part of the back work that goes into them, they just don't take the time and trouble. And as a result, many phase history books have when JL and I call the greatest hits. It's, hmm. you know, Buzz on the Moon and Style Lab and we picked it again. There's nothing wrong with them. They're great photos. But everybody's seen them over and over again. 
So that really is the important thing to stress about what our niche is here, what we try to do. Our focus is primarily as a business that six what we, we put out is on stuff you haven't seen that's not been public. Um, and that's, that's our thing. I want to throw one more thing in real quick. It's a little side thing. And we were talking about quality of photos. We're working on some future projects and we're about ready to go to work with a different publisher. And we had sent a sample chapter of what we want to do into this publisher. And it really made me feel good when they liked what we did. And we think we do have something going with them. But he said, we were especially impressed by the quality of the photos that you sent in in the sample chapter. I'm going, yeah, there, see, that's what it's all about. That's awesome. That's awesome. So were there any moments in the Mercury photos and and the uh, book you just released that you both felt, you know, illuminated what a particular person was like or or really captured his or her essence and and why? Well, that's a good question. Uh, I'll try to take a a crack at it. All seven of them, we'd see them in situations or reactions or clowning around. And you go, hey, you know, these guys will be ultimate professional, but yet they still have the normal reactions and emotions uh, that, that the rest of us do. And in a way that brings them, I think, a little bit more down to earth, if you will, to see that they're subject to the same concerns and, and, and worries that, that, that we have. Mm. I just came away after looking at all these photos you just get the impression that it was a much tighter group that did so much in that time period with so few people when compared with later programs. Uh, the Mercury group was just tight. There was one gentleman by the time I got through looking through all the photos that I had kind of had a new appreciation for in a way. And that was Dr. Douglas. It looked like Dr. Douglas had quite a sense of humor that I never had picked up on before, but there are, there's no shortage of photos of him. I don't know if I would say clowning around, but certainly having fun with equipment or props or with the astronauts in general. And it's such a shame that I don't know if you're aware that he had come down to the Cape to see Glenn's shuttle launch and he, uh, I don't, I don't remember. Did he have a car accident or he had a heart attack or something, but he died on the way back home. Wow. Oh, wow. So, but he's one of those guys that would have been, you know, would have been so nice to talk to or share some of these photos with, and his son passed away as well. So there's oh. like no, there's like no Douglas's left to uh, hear this guy plays a, such a prominent part of this book. Wow. Fortunately, D is still around though. D O'Hara is, was, is, is great. And she loves the book. And uh, she's been a real pleasure to share things with. So for those who don't know, Dr. William Douglas was the personal physician of the Mercury 7. Uh, He was with them so much. He was often called the eighth astronaut. Um, So did he work really closely alongside D. O'Hara? Oh, yes. He was the flight surgeon and she was his, uh, I hate to even say assistant. She was his almost assistant doctor. I mean, yes. Very close. It's right. It's important to remember how few people are worth that that worried me on this is mind blowing. Yeah. Cause because that's certainly a name you don't hear very often. You hear D. O'Hara's name a lot more than you hear uh, Dr. William Douglas, don't you? That's certainly uh, right. I, I imagine that's something to do with uh, trying to sex up the TV shows a little bit and you've got a female uh, character which of which there were not many back then so um i suppose that's probably one of the reasons isn't it yeah absolutely i for one was a little disappointed we didn't get any exclusive photos of alan shepherd crying in the rain with his shirt off you know <laughs> i'm kidding i'm kidding i'm got kidding it. i'm kidding that's if right. anybody saw the right stuff on disney you'll you'll understand you'll, you'll right. get that reference there <laughs> yes anyway what strikes me about these books and what I think actually ties in with that core thing uh, of your philosophy as well is that what you guys have done is you've ena- enabled us to tell the story of these people and other missions and that we've loved in the past as well in a new way 
because we're seeing a side of these people or these missions that we've not seen before and given us a, a, a different viewpoint to look at these things from because we haven't seen these before. And that, for, for someone like me who thinks they know everything about these programs, is just wonderful. So hang on a moment, you get to see them like this? We've not seen this side of them before. And it's such a visual thing, isn't it? So so when you come across these photos, which I think is what, what this last question was was getting at that must be really amazing when you come across something you go no no surely not we're seeing this person like this uh is there anything which you felt you can't publish i was a little um uncomfortable maybe with uh two or three of the photos that we did use in this book um i, I know there were some pictures of carpenter smoking there's no shortage of pictures of him smoking. And others. Yeah, right. And others too. And I didn't know if that would rub some folks wrong. And there's a interesting picture of Slayton in there, I think, with Grace Worley testing that was a little uh unusual. But you know, hey, it's it's part of history. It's it's the way these guys are. I think I know what picture you're talking about, and I'm very ashamed that I remember what it is. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he's uh, strapped to a uh, strapped to a, yeah. a, up a wall. Yeah, they're doing yeah. some weird test to him, and I was like, "What is? Right. What in God's name are they doing to that child?" Yeah, it's yeah. very strange. And they to yeah. address with your comment that you you learn new things about the people. Uh, they sh- if people at the three to tell already, JL is primarily the photo guy on the writer. So, from my perspective, um, my, one of my goals and. But all our books is to tell you as much about that photo as we can to give it a mm. lot of context that's critical because otherwise it's, you know, Apollo 11 launches to the moon, you know, well, duh, you know, what else do we tell me about that picture? And when, when we are working with such high resolution stuff and such unusual stuff, there'll be some piece of hardware or equipment or some process. We go, what in the world are they doing there? So that involves a lot of research. In, into the background of it. And yeah, so you, you I, I learn, I hope the readers learn new things about some of the not hardware technology and the processes that were involved beyond just, just the astronaut. Does that mean you have an extensive spreadsheet with like the, the number of a photograph and then who, main person who's in it and then other facts about it, perhaps who took the photo? I don't think we're quite that organized. Typically, <laughs> well, JL will, in, in, Usually, JL will send me a chapter of the, right. and I'll look through them and say, "Oh, I like that one. I like that one." And you know, I will. I've limited Nito out, and then once we get the pictures all set and in order, then I'll go to work uh, writing the captions for. Them. But we do we, we do have to turn in a master spreadsheet to the publisher at the end. Well, <laughs> our numbers, right. and that's a big name of the butt for Mister Pickering, but that's his <laughs> thing. It's the photo guys. So. As far as organizing these photos. It's still an ongoing problem, which I've leaned heavily on Ed Hengefeld for. <laughs> there was no organization with these when we picked them up. It wasn't as simple as everything from MA6 is one in one big envelope. It's not. They're all over the place. So when you look at images of, say, uh, Glenn or Carpenter suited up, you have to sit there and go, okay, is, is this Carpenter getting ready for his flight or is he backing up Glenn at this flight uh, for his flight? And we try to keep everything totally, you know, separate by, by missions. And I think we did a really good job, but it's, uh, it's been a real headache. The other programs are not like that, but Mercury is a, is a real hodgepodge of, of release dates. That's another thing. If you look at the NASA release dates on the actual prints, the dates are rarely correct because oh, wow. they would release batches of photos all at once, maybe a week before the launch. And those photos were not taken on that date. They could have been taken at any time in the prior month. So you really get to a point where you, you, you learn your dates, your activity dates uh, during the program quite well. At some point. Did they just get better at documenting things then? Yeah, they, they get better at documenting. There's still issues there as well, but you knew which crews were which crews all the time. There were, right. you know, if you, the activities were just easier to, at least in my opinion, photo-wise, they were, they were easier to assign 
dates too. So did you get really good at, at seeing someone and going, okay, their haircut and that photo is they're parting slightly there is it is it that the kind of level of detail that you're looking at so that must yep. have been when he was back up rather than in prime crew oh yeah a huge problem would be uh on these mercury lunches where they would have a scrub right the mcgrissom one is a special problem between the july 19th and the 21st date there's extensive photos uh photo cards of each day so you have to figure out exactly what everybody's wearing uh, or where, what side of badges on, maybe you'd look for these little things and you're really in trouble if they're wearing the same clothes, but you're right. You look for the, all those little details in the background. I would like to mention two things that were interesting that, that we turned up during the research here that was surprising, I think to, to us. The first one was there has been a story circulating for a long time because it's in a couple of books that when the working reserve first went down to the gate. But that evening they saw a uh, unmade rock launch and it blew up. They, you know, upset about that. Well, no, that's not the case. It's not what happened. You were able to, to show uh, that happened the night before they came down. And so we disproved that long-standing theory that was kind of grim. And another little fascinating tidbit is, and if you've read the whole book and you saw this, who knew that Alan Shepard took the controls of the, uh, the AC uh, aircraft that was carrying him back from Great Grand Island. Island. <laughs> I mean, here he is sitting there with the headset on, he would smile at his face with the controls, piloting his own plane back. I mean, who in the world <laughs> even suspected that? So there's little surprises like that that are pretty cool. Absolutely. So we've had uh, a couple of questions from our Patreon subscribers. Um, I hope you don't mind. Gillian Cassie has asked, if you have a favorite photo and why, and this can be from any of your pre previous books, if you had to pick one photo from your whole collection or anything you've ever seen, which one would go up on your wall from, and it can be from any mission ever. What's your favorite space flight photo? Oh boy, that is so hard to answer. All right, I'll, I'll go first and you can think of yeah. it. Yeah. I, I, have, I have one that I picked up because we, we do get this question uh, pretty regularly. Uh, I have one that I picked out from our book about Mercury in general. I think it's the Gemini 10 crew, JL, uh, walking up the ramp. Uh, at the base of the bad at bad nineteen, and they're reaching over the railing and shaking the hands of these men that have gathered at the at just you know a few feet below them wearing hard hats. I mean, this to me is just it so demonstrated the informality of those days and how few people were working on it. And hey, guys, you know what they're gonna yeah. go up and they'll get in the bird today. Let's go out to the pad and watch you goodbye. And hey, there you go and shake hands. You know, it was very, very informal. And there was a real, a real can do spirit about that, that, you know, we're going to roll our sleeves and, and get this, get this thing done. And it's a black and white photo, but there's so much texture in there. There's a puddle of water on the ground. It's, it's just a terrific photo. I mean, okay. I'm going to, I'm going to give you one that hasn't been published yet, but I, I think we might be, we're going to use it in the future. It's uh, from Apollo 16. Uh, the day of the countdown test and the crew has come out of the elevator and Maddie Lee stops on the catwalk and he's got one leg up. He's fully suited. He's got one leg up and he's looking out at the, or, you know, he's just taking in the view. It's, and it's such a nice, it's an amazing photo and, uh, you'll see it one of these days. So excellent. And, uh, and I love, I love any night picture of a rocket on the pad. They're just gorgeous. Take your pick. They're just so impressive. Absolutely. They still are today, but there was something about the, something about that Saturn V on the pad all lit up. I think it just helps with the framing as well, with the, the, the beams of light going towards oh. it. Just, just oh. the way it frames is so good. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. She has a follow-up, which is, uh, what is the most surprising photo you've ever uncovered? Well, there's, there's a couple of them that pop into my mind in our book about John Kennedy and the space program, which I, if you haven't seen that, I think it's a terrific book. It's the only book that, that describes everything that Kennedy did during his three years in office as president in connection with the space program. And he went to um, Huntsville to watch the static firing of the uh, first stage of, a, of the Saturn. And it turns out to the photos that we dug out, that Von Braun took him right up, uh, right up to the test day. 
And you see LeBron and Kennedy sort of try to keep their feet dry and, and there's, you know, mist in the air. And I mean, that water's coming down and cooling off that bad. And there's no written or movie or other re- recordation of him doing that, going with, with, with Rod Ball right up to the, to wow. the chest stand and seeing that with that, that, that steamy hot water. I thought that was really cool. That is a good one. I, I always get a little chuckle out of things I find. In the back of photos, it's always when I'm cleaning a photo up usually. So you, yeah. you get into the, some of the details and I laugh. There's one that cracks me up every time. It's the, uh, it was a month or two before Apollo Soyuz and the backup crew was at the Cape going around to the different areas and the different shops doing some, you know, uh, glad handing with some of the crew or some of the workers. And there's this one shot where clearly in the background there's this nude pit up on a calendar and somebody wasn't looking close enough on on that sort of that sort of thing there's some apollo 14 um shots i i picked up a few uh, months ago where uh the crew would come back to the cape after after a mission and have a a big reception in the vab for the workers and they go out to a luncheon and so at the head table, Shepard's in the middle, and Debus is on one side, and Mitchell's on the other side. And Shepard's trying to eat, and you can tell that Debus is right in his ear talking, and then Mitchell's on the other side with a cigarette blowing in his in his face. <laughs> like, yeah, you know, that must be an odd, odd feeling, you know. <laughs> so it's stuff like that. The same roll of film had a nice shot of a Shepard signing a golf ball for one of the workers too, which I'd nice. never seen before. Nice. That's cool. Very nice. Um, we, we've also had a great question from Don Irwin, who asks, uh, in the earlier days when film was being used, do, do from the photos you've uncovered, do they appear, do photographers appear to be more selective with their shots? Or do they take photos like we do nowadays, where they just took as many as possible in the hopes of getting the perfect shot? They did. On, on, on the negatives I see, Bill was known as, a, what was it, two... Uh, to take bill or something because he always <laughs> took two shots and that's a good rule of thumb because somebody's always going to close their eyes there's always going to be one that's better than the other but uh it wasn't un- it was not unusual to see six six frames that are very similar i think it's important to remember too that yes i sure remember those days when you got a, a little roll of film that you tore the little uh oil bag open and loaded it the back of your camera and you get, well, maybe 24 exposures. And yeah. you, oh boy, you were really careful with those exposures. I will say, I think if you're Bill Tom or your, um, who's the Life Magazine photographer, Ralph Morse, you know, you've got money to have a right. lot of film. Right. Yeah. Take a lot of exactly pictures, right. So. Yeah, you're not paying for it, so it's fine. Yeah, I remember Polaroid film was really expensive, the, the stuff like that. So, yeah, you, you really like tried to conserve who you were taking a Polaroid for. Like, hey, give me a picture. Like, no, nah, dude, I'm saving it. For something. <laughs> that's right. That's exactly. Right. Exactly. So Donna has a follow-up. Well, he also wants to know more about how you how you collect photos. When you get to an archive or when someone says, hey, I've got all these photos, are they normally negatives or prints or a combination of all? Or, or do people sometimes just send you huge digital libraries these days as well? Or, does, or is that less common? Well, uh, I do get digital ones every once in a while. We had the uh, book signing at the Cape, what, about six months ago? Not this last one, the one before that, where somebody came up who was on the Hornet. Oh, wow. On the recovery ship. He, he was in the service and on the Hornet for Apollo 11 and 12. Wow. And he brought along a, a little photo uh, album to show me. And there was a lot of, there was quite a few that I had never seen, obviously, because he took them yeah. and they were very good. And, uh, he said, yeah, I can send you, uh, I'll send you, uh, uh, the, um, well, I'll upload the Im- images for you. And that doesn't always work out, you know, but uh, a week after I got home, sure enough, uh, the, the, there were probably 150 images from the recovery, which I will use, uh, in the future. Other than that, if I go, if somebody says they have something and I go over, uh, to see what it is, it used to be prints all the time. Now it has evolved to where it's people that have negatives as well and they usually have some ties with the program at the same time i'll wonder well 
why why do you have these negatives? <laughs> you, there's, there's been some cases where uh, they they probably shouldn't. And uh, and one incident in particular, I'm reminded of that is a guy had some stuff, and uh, it wasn't until I got back home and I started going through the negatives themselves, and it was the original 35 millimeter negatives from for the Apollo 11 countdown test when the crew was in the white room. And I'm going, oh, you shouldn't, he shouldn't have these. So I'm going to, I'm going to turn them over to the archives, but you could see where the frames were missing that they used wow. uh, from that test that have been released. Wow. But, uh, I, I did scan the rest of them. It's not the most exciting thing in the world, but there are some good ones in there when you start looking at them all together. Yeah. There's a reason they chose the ones they chose, right? And you see that all the time when you, when you visit the archives, if they're, uh, large frame negatives and there's eight or 12 of them, there'll be a couple of frames missing. And those are the ones that they, re- they released. Yeah, they are good ones, but I'm, I've seen enough in the archives that there are plenty of them that never saw the light of day, which is what the Apollo 11 book that we released is, is primarily made up of that was stuff that didn't, they got left on the, left back on the, on the cutting room floor, as they say. So when you're putting a book together, I mean, this this latest book's slightly easier because it's all come from one photographer. But how easy is it to piece together? Do you have to in the, in the, in releasing a book name the photographer for every photo, and and do they get credit? So obviously, I'm a musician, right? So copyright laws and all that kind of stuff is is always on my mind. But photography is very different from songs. So do, does everyone get compensated for photos that they may have taken, or is it? printed with permission how, how does that work when you're put into uh, sorry and this may be the most boring question ever but i'm i find this stuff interesting how does it work to put together a book like this when you've got people and photos coming from different sources and different photographers no it's, it's a good question dave and fortunately uh nasa as a u.s government agency does not assert copyright on any of its sorrow yeah so that's 60 percent of what we've come across but yes, as far as the private photographers, Jay up to talk more about this, but we do credit them as, as best as we can. We're definitely interested in, in that and giving them credit. And that just a footnote, another thing that we try to do, and I'm really proud about this, we try our best to identify as many people in each photo as possible. And you just do not see that. It's like, hey, there's the three astronauts. Well, what about that guy over there? What about that person back there? What about them? They were they sort of important too. So that's really a, uh, a trademark of our book. But JL, you could talk more about um, photo credit. Yeah, well, obviously Bill didn't take all these pictures, but right. the buck stopped with Bill. <laughs> he was the the guy who determined what was going to be used. I think we we identify that fact yeah. in the book that there were other photo photographers involved as well. <clears throat> as how many they had. I'm going to guess they probably had 15 at the Cape, at least 15 or 20. This is one of many questions from this area, this era that I so wish some of these people that I knew 10 years ago that have passed away could have really helped us out, but they're not around anymore. And the same goes for research on a book like this. That led, leads me to thinking of that. It's, it's, it's been more of a challenge, I think, than the other books. Because so many of these people are gone, yeah. Uh, that you could ask, call them up and ask about or show them something. Am I right, John? I mean, I think oh no, it, yeah, that's absolutely the case. And especially when when you're working on Project Mercury, yeah. You know, I would I track down Dr. Howard Minner, we were a flight surgeon, and they didn't even want to tell us about him, and he was very helpful in, in a lot of ways. Uh, there's another uh, Bob Boats, yeah, Bob Boats, track him down yeah. still a lot. So there are some people and it was funny, you know, we like to have somebody even prominent do our forwards and we're racking our brains because yeah, everybody had gone and finally, I don't know, one of us said, wait a minute, G Francis is the book. Yeah. So we were very fortunate to contact G and have been do the forward. And it, it should be a lesson that any other researchers or authors out there are listening to this. Uh, what JL says is right. You know, you talk to your people now, interview them now, get your facts in order now because they just will not be around forever. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. So finally, we always want more 
after viewing your latest books and photos. So what can we expect from Pickering and Disney in the future? Can you give us a, maybe a little sneak peek? Well, we do have some other projects in the works. One that we may be able to say something about it in a couple of months. Would you think Vail, something like that? Right. We, we are working on a follow-up to our uh, uh, Picture in the Space Show book. And oh. I have to say, I think we took the right approach to that. You see space shuttle books that, hey, it's a space shuttle program. Well, guess what, folks? There were 135 space shuttle missions. So if you give two pages to each mission, you're already at like, you know, what, 260 pages. So we said, no, 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 no. Let's take a, take a bite-sized approach. And the, our shuttle book just was up through the first four orbital satellites. So we have a follow-up book that works on that that will again involve a limited number of missions so that we can show you a lot of pages from each flight. The Taub family would really like us to do a follow-up book that talks more about Bill and his life as a NASA photographer because we only use his Mercury photos. There mm. are photos from his other, from the other programs as well. Uh, Especially and- his wind tunnel stuff at Lewitt's. Yeah, the wind tunnel stuff, the Apollo 11 world tour. I mean, there's a lot of, of in Apollo 13 world tour. Wow. So, I mean, there's definitely more stuff in the can as far as the top thing goes. Awesome. But yeah, there's, but there's a lot of stuff coming up. We're going to be busy for a while. I think we'll put it that way. Yeah. Excellent. When they say we're going to use all, all those Apollo pictures, we're going to use those. Well, I think we're going to get to use them finally. So fantastic. Well, I can't wait. Thank you both very much for your time today and for joining us. And uh, we look forward to to find out what you're up to in the future. And we'll definitely be talking about it. That's for sure. We always talk about your book. So uh, looking forward to to more projects in the future. And thank you. Thanks for having us on. Thank you so much. You're listening to Space and Things with Emily Carney (laughs) and Dave Giles. Well, I thoroughly enjoyed that chat and I would love to rummage through those archives that they've got and all those different photos and see so much more than what's already in those books, which I absolutely love. What a great position they have put themselves in. Exactly. Uh, And I can tell you as somebody who was a big supporter of Retro Space Images and I have a lot of their uh, photo discs that they used to release, there are so many photos that JL and John have you're never going to see them everywhere, anywhere else. And a lot of people will say, especially on the internet, you know, oh, these photos are available through NASA. You know, that NASA has its own photographs. NASA does have their own public domain photos, right? But not all of them are great quality. And you've seen them a million times. You know, they're not really rare or anything like that. These Pickering and Bisney photographs, great quality, awesome quality, and you've never seen them. You, you become addicted real quick. So, mm-hmm. You know, as a space historian, it's just, they're doing incredible stuff. So I I love them. And uh, I can't wait to see what they come up with next as far as books are concerned. I know they can't say much about their latest project, but whatever it is, I cannot wait. I'm definitely, I'll go out and buy it. (laughs) Yeah, you you can't not want to have these books. When you go to Kennedy Space Center, the, the, the shop there, they've got a few of the books on display. And they're also really beautiful books. They're really nice books to have. So if you haven't got one, go and get one. And of course, the full yes. uh, interview is available on our Patreon page. That's patreon.com forward slash space and things. My fellow Americans, it's time for Space and Things with Emily Carney and Dave Giles, that crazy Englishman. Watch out for that guy. Yep. So, Emily, what has caught your eye in the world of spaceflight this week? On my news feed this morning, I was struck by this story. Is NASA prepared for an internet apocalypse? Oh, my God. And if you read the headlines, <laughs> you're going to think, oh, my God, it's right around the corner. It's going to happen today. <laughs> yeah, the internet apocalypse is apparently upon us. But I did a little bit of digging because I was like, this sounds nuts. Like, this doesn't sound like it's going to happen right now. But if you read the headlines, you're going to think it's uh, imminent. Apparently, solar activity from the sun is ramping up. Uh, which means we could have more geomagnetic, uh, I'm sorry, I screwed up that word pretty bad, geomagnetic storms, right? Yeah. So there's a, a theory that was published in a 2021 paper, uh, not by NASA, it's, it's by a paper from a University of California researcher, 
And the researcher does suppose that a solar superstorm can cause uh, large-scale internet outages. This is verbatim from the paper, covering the entire globe and lasting several months. Uh, so this is something that this researcher, and it's, it's, it's a scientist, uh, is supposing could happen, and it has the possibility of happening. But um, yeah, apparently some people from TikTok have got a hold of this, <laughs> and now it's like, it's imminent and we're all going to die, basically. So, um, yeah, so it's something to keep an eye on. This is definitely something that's a possibility within the next decade. But um, I do want to add that uh, the NASA does have several, uh, NASA and ESA, I believe, have several probes that monitor solar activity. So hopefully if something like this was on its way, they'd have a pretty good uh, handle on it. But um, I do want to mention that there was a big solar event in the 1800s uh, called the Carrington event, which knocked out a lot of their communication of that time. And it, this was pre-internet, obviously, <laughs> pre-telephone. It really was characterized as the perfect solar storm. So um, it's definitely, uh, it's something we should think about. And But NASA has a, has a pretty good lock on it with their solar probes and ESA as well. But if you read the headlines, you're you're going to think, oh, my God, we're all going to die. This is upon us. So that's something I did notice this week just because I was like, Internet apocalypse. What the hell? Solar apocalypse. You know, <laughs> I think in Florida, I think in Florida, the solar apocalypse is already upon us anyway, because so, it's like nine. It is nine thousand degrees outside right now. So, Dave, what has caught your eye in space flight this last week? Well, a few things as this po- the day this podcast comes out, apparently, Virgin Galactic are going to have their first launch of a commercial crew, which is fantastic. It's got the some. It's an Italian military um, mission, essentially. Um, so I'll put a link in the show notes about that. Uh, wow, it's, it's good. Recent recently, there's been a few more countries sign up to the Artemis Accords, and last week we had India and Ecuador. A few weeks ago was Spain. So that's that seems to be ramping up quite nicely, which is good. Bepi, the Bepi Colombo fly past. Went well, which is all good. It's what we like to hear. ULA have delayed the launch, uh, the first launch of the Vulcan Centaur, which is a shame. And we had the Delta, the penultimate Delta Four Heavy launch went off uh, last week, didn't it? And, and apparently that was quite it the did. show for those who were there. Unfortunately, I did not see it because it was too nasty here. It was too rainy, but that's okay. I'll, I'll hopefully see the last. One. Yeah, so. you might want to try and get across for the last one. And maybe it's a, I don't know if it's a Vandenberger here. I, it could be. I mean, I'll check it out, whatever it is. It'd be kind of neat. I've never been to Vandenberg, so that would be kind of cool. I know it's probably expensive, but be hey, good, when in once in a lifetime. Yeah, you know? well, well, it'd be a good first launch to see from Vandenberg, the final Delta Heavy. Or Delta yeah. Heavy. Oh, yeah. But the thing that's really caught my eye this week is the, a story that's broken. Uh, NASA has announced that the full cost of the Mars sample return it has gone through the roof. In wow. 2020, it was reviewed that it would cost $3.8 billion to $4.4 billion, which was That's an a lot. increase. Okay. Well, that was also an increase from earlier estimates, whereas this week it's now okay. gone up to 8 to $9 billion. Oh, Jesus. To bring back a bit of Mars rock from the... the uh, Percy is collecting at the moment. So there's a lot of talk about whether it's worth doing it at this precise moment because that will impact other scientific missions, which will obviously be a hard pill to swallow for other missions. There's not a, a, an infinite amount of funds going available for scientific interplanetary missions. So do we need it right now? Do we need that sample right now? Obviously, it'd be great to have it, but that's a huge cost jump, which will impact other things. So that, to me, is the one that really jumped out because we've been talking about that sample return on a number of occasions. Uh, it'd be a shame if it doesn't happen, but do we need? is it likely to happen now? I think it might just have got a bit more pushed a bit further back, which is a shame. I think there's been sort of an ages-long sort of debate in the interplanetary community like Mars versus the other planet. Why is Mars more important than the other planets? And I know because they think Mars is closer to an Earth analog, but I, I think Venus is worth it. You know, I know Venus is not very hospitable, but I think Venus is worth figuring out, mainly because we don't know a lot about it. It's very mysterious. I've always been intrigued by it in the and night. It's closer to us. Yeah, and I've always been intrigued by it, you know, in the night sky because it's 
you know, if you look at it through a telescope, it's just clouds. You don't see anything. And I, I've always been intrigued by that. So I'm like, you know, as much as I, I'm a fan of Mars, you know, I mean, I think a case can be made for other planets as well. You know, like, okay, this planet is also, this world is also worth trying to figure out. Absolutely. Well, as always, I'll put links in the show notes to all these stories that we've talked about uh, so you can have a look at those. Where mis- mispronunciation is entertainment, it's space and things. Well, that's it for this week. Thanks very much for listening. We hope that you enjoyed this episode. Coming up to episode 150, which feels quite ridiculous. Thanks to those who share what we do and those who have left a review. Jet Screamer 0769 did just that on Apple Podcasts this week. Thank you for your comments on our recent episode with Francis French. We're glad we helped make your Thursday morning commute into Manhattan more enjoyable. Uh, don't forget to everyone, this is... Uh, Even if you don't have any words to say, you can leave a star rating on most podcast providers. And it may seem like a small thing, but it does help us in being discovered by new listeners. So if we can get 150 ratings by 150th show, that would really be quite lovely for us. So two weeks, come on. You've got two weeks. Get get a rating in. You can do it. I I just can't believe it's been 150 shows. Wow. That's a lot. So, (laughs) wow. Yeah. Anyway, uh, wow. Thank you to those who continue to support us on Patreon. Uh, please check it out if you haven't already on patreon.com slash space and things. And of course, in space, don't forget, no one can hear you me. Things in space, space and things. Okay.